Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We'll start with the second talk of this morning. This one's from Sean Harmer, and it's regarding uh, modern shader-based OpenGL techniques. Morning, everybody. Everybody wide awake after last night's festivities? Yeah, I'm not. Right, so this morning we're going to talk about what the sort of things are we can do with OpenGL, with Qt5, and taking a bit more full use of the GPU than what things like Qt Quick and other aspects of Qt you may have seen do at the moment. So we're going to start off with a small introduction. We're just going to cover some of the basic classes that are in Qt that allow you to do things with OpenGL. So things like vertex buffers and contexts, very briefly cover those. Then we'll have a look at some simple lighting techniques we can do. We'll cover the basic Fong lighting model, and then we'll have a look at some small tricks we can do with that to do various techniques such as cartoon rendering and also wireframe rendering in a single pass. We'll then go on to have a look at something called instanced rendering, which is where we can really make the GPU work for its money. Okay, instance rendering, we can really go to town with the amount of geometry we can process at any one time. Every modern game nowadays uses that technique. And then if we have enough time, we'll finish off having a quick look at some post-processing effects. So this is where we will render a scene into a frame buffer object, and then we'll run that through the pipeline once more and apply various effects to it. And this is used directly inside the new QT graphical effects module that's part of Qt5. So after this, hopefully you should be able to see the background of how all those graphical effects work and take away this, learn a bit more about shaders and write your own graphical effects for QML and Qt Quick 2. So let's get started. Oops, I've gone too far. Throughout this, we'll have a look at a couple of examples. And we've got some helper classes on the way. Window is just a very, very simple subclass of a new class in Qt5 called QWindow. It represents, as you may guess from the name, a window. Okay. Abstract Scene is just a very, very simple interface that I've come up with for these set of examples. It has entry points, member functions, just like QGL widget from Qt4. So it's got an initialize, um, resize, and paint function. In addition to that, it's got one extra, which is called update, which is where we can do our work to update our scene variables. It's not OpenGL dependent at all. We're just modifying run-of-the-mill member variables. So let's have a very quick look at our first example. So let me collapse all these. Uh, where has it gone? Oops. And run that. There we go. Wonderful. A triangle. Okay. This is our hello world typical triangle. What have we done here? All we've done is we've created a couple of arrays. The first array contains the coordinates of the three vertices of that triangle. The second array contains the colors of each vertex. We pass those down to the pipeline. They get transformed into whatever coordinate system we feel like using, and they get interpolated by the fixed functionality part of the pipeline and handed off to something called the fragment shader. The fragment shader receives those interpolated values, does some more calculations with them if it feels like it, and whatever that decides to output is what gets displayed in the corresponding pixel on the screen. Very, very simple stuff but we can do a lot with that nowadays with the new flexible pipeline. So very briefly, let's have a look at our window class. So you said it inherits from QWindow, and it's very, very simple. All we've done is we've added in something called a Qt OpenGL context. If you're doing anything with OpenGL in Qt, you need a context. This just contains all of the current rendering state used by OpenGL. So it decides, is depth testing enabled? 
um, are depth rights enabled, what's the blending function, so on and so forth. Don't normally you have to worry about it too much, we just create a context, tell it what version and profile of OpenGL we want to use. In this particular example we're going to be using 3.3. So let's see how to do that. So in our constructor we initialize the base class. The first thing we have to do is tell Qt that we want to use OpenGL with this window. So we call set surface type OpenGL surface. That is an instruction to the underlying QPA platform plugin that it needs to go off and create a window surface that is compatible with OpenGL. The default is the raster surface. Okay, so if you want to use OpenGL, you must do that. We're then creating something called a queue surface format, which is some requests we're giving to the QPA plugin again that tells it which version of OpenGL we want to use and some other options as well. So here we're asking for a major version of three, a minor version of three, um, so we'll get OpenGL 3.3 if the graphics card supports it. We're asking for a core profile. Don't worry too much about that. And the set samples for line, that's just asking for the QPA plugin to enable multi-sampling. What that means is for every pixel on the screen, your GPU is actually rendering four pixels. And then it averages them in some clever way to get a nice anti-aliasing effect. Okay, so that's a very, very simple way to enable anti-aliasing in your OpenGL applications. It does, however, come at a cost. We're rendering four times as many pixels. That's four times as much memory that the frame buffer has to use, and it's four times as much work the fragment shader has to do. Okay, so you, that's a knob you can tweak to balance performance versus quality. Once we've got our surface format, we call set format, which is a function on queue window. And then finally, we call the create function. That's what actually goes to the QPA backend and says, make me a window, make me something to draw on. Then we create a queue open gel context. We set the same format on the context and we call create on the context. At that point, it goes once more to the QPA plugin. And it says, create me an OpenGL context for that platform. Okay, those couple of steps, creating the window, creating the context, if you were to do those without Qt on the Windows platform, that would probably take you a good 200 to 300 lines of code. Okay, creating windows and creating contexts natively on platforms is a royal pain in the backside. Qt saves you a lot of work by doing this nicely for you on all platforms. Okay, even works on embedded platforms such as uh, BlackBerry 10, and it will work on Android and iOS as well. So you can use the same code everywhere. Finally, just down the bottom here, we're setting up a simple timer. This is just what we're using to drive our scene updates. So we're just driving an update every 16 milliseconds. We're not doing anything fancy here at all. Then we end up in our initialize GL function. This is very similar approach to what is it done in QGL widget in Qt4. So what we do here, we do something called making the context current. Think of the context as your toolbox of rendering tools, your paintbrushes and pens, and the window as your piece of paper or your canvas. All we're doing is saying, I want to use these pens and pencils on this piece of paper. That's all it does. And then we're calling the initialize function of our scene, which we'll have a look at in a second. Similarly for the resize GL functions, we make sure our context is current and we call the equivalent function on our scene class. Nothing complex there at all. The painting one has one extra step. So we make the context current as usual. We tell the scene to render itself using OpenGL. And then finally at the end, we have to remember to swap the buffers. If you don't do that, you're going to end up sitting there at a black screen. I've done it many times. It's easy to forget and yet... Ugh. Okay, so that's the basic framework we've got to work with. So let's have a look at our initialize function. Oops, wrong class. It's gone to the base class by mistake. 
Initialize. What are we doing? Ignore all the stuff about this M underscore VAO. That's just something additional we don't need to worry about today. Prepare shader program. This is where we're building our custom OpenGL pipeline. For the custom pipeline, what we have is this guy here. This is a very, very simplified view of the OpenGL pipeline. So on the left, we have our application, where we have all of our data to start with. Our application sets all its ducks up in a row. It feeds the data over to the GPU side of the fence. And it does that by means of something called vertex buffer objects, which we'll see very, very shortly. The first place it goes into is something called the vertex shader. The vertex shader is a tiny, tiny program that runs on the GPU. And it runs on the GPU once for every vertex that you pass through to it. Hence the name. So for our triangle, the vertex shader would have been executed three times. It then goes through some fixed functionality parts of the pipeline, so where it does clipping and something called primitive assembly, which is where it collects together all of the primitives for one shape, so our triangle. It chops off any bits that wouldn't fit on the screen and throws them away. And then it goes into the rasterizer. The rasterizer is where our data explosion happens. So it's got our triangle potentially clipped to the screen. And what it does is it decides what vertex attributes get interpolated to every single pixel that would appear inside our triangle. OK, those pixels are actually called fragments. They're kind of like pixels in training. OK, they have to go through a series of hoops and tests before they can get onto the screen. So our fragments go into the fragment shader. The fragment shader is the second part of our pipeline, which is possible to customize. And you can see from we've gone from vertices to fragments. The fragment shader is going to be executed a lot. OK, we're talking potentially hundreds of thousands of executions per frame. OK, GPUs can do this very, very well, though. They're massively parallel things. After it's gone through the fragment shader, there's a few more tests in there in between things like depth test, alpha test, whatever. And if it's lucky, the pixel survives or the fragment survives and it ends its life as a pixel on the screen. And that's what you see. So what we're interested in is all the funky things we can do by customizing the vertex shader and the fragment shader. And it turns out it's quite a lot. So quickly back to our example. How do we prepare a shader program? A shader program is the combination of the vertex shader and the fragment shader. Luckily, Qt has a very handy class called Q OpenGL shader program. Clues in the name. That represents the vertex shader and the fragment shader. So to use that, all we do is we instantiate it and then we call a very handy function add shader from source file. Into that we pass in an enum value, which is vertex or fragment, telling it which one it corresponds to, and then a path to a source file for our fragment shader or vertex shader. Dead easy. What that does is it opens up the file, reads in the text, compiles it. OK, these shader programs get compiled on the GPU. So your graphics card driver actually does include a full blown compiler. If anything goes wrong with it, we can query what went wrong by calling the log function. That will give you the compiler error messages hopefully give you some clues as to what to see to go fix your shader program. We do exactly the same thing for the fragment shader. And then at the end, just like with a C++ program, we link our compilation units into one complete program. Again, we check to make sure nothing's gone wrong with that. So at that stage, we've now got a completely functional OpenGL pipeline. We've made a vertex shader, we've made a fragment shader, we've linked them together. That completes that whole pipeline. We've filled in the blanks. Our data, in this simple example, just comes from two simple C arrays. 
So our vertex data is just three points, X, Y, Z, for each vertex. And color data is the same. It's just red, green, and blue components on a scale of 0 to 1. I mentioned vertex buffer objects. This is how we get data from the CPU side of the application over to the GPU side. Qt has a very handy class. Again, Q OpenGL buffer. Okay, the naming is fairly obvious what these things do. It's just a buffer of memory. It's a block of memory managed by OpenGL. To use this, we actually have to first of all instantiate the Q OpenGL buffer object itself and then explicitly create it. The reason for that is it allows us to instantiate the QOpenGL buffer object without having a current OpenGL context. So we can decide when we actually want to instantiate this object proper. So we create it, we give Qt and OpenGL a hint as to how we want to use this. In this particular case we're saying QOpenGL buffer static draw. That means this data is not going to change very often. Okay. That has implications for how well the GPU and the driver can optimize this. That hint very, very strongly suggests that data should reside in GPU RAM. That means the GPU has got very, very fast access to it. It can do all sorts of nice things very quickly. We then bind our OpenGL buffer. That just means make this current. This is the one we want to work on. That's just the way OpenGL is architected at the moment. And then finally, we allocate our data to it. So we pass in a pointer to our array, and then we specify the amount or the size of the data to buffer. This is not specifying the format of the data, it's literally just the amount of data. From that point on, the driver takes over, and at some point in the future, it will upload it to the GPU for you. You don't need to worry about that at all. We do the same thing for the colors. And then down here, we tell OpenGL what on earth these vertex buffers actually correspond to. At the moment, it's just two blocks of data. It doesn't know. So the first thing we do is we bind our shader program. This makes our pipeline current. This is the one we want to use. We then bind our vertex position buffer. So that makes our vertex positions current. We then flick a switch. We're saying, I want to enable this per vertex attribute, and I want to call it vertex position inside my shader code. That's all it does, just switches it on. And then finally, the set attribute buffer function on QOpenGL shader program allows us to specify, again, the name of the variable inside the shader it corresponds to, and the type and the format of our data. This is just the stride and the number of points or the number of elements per vertex. OK, so at this point, OpenGL knows everything about our data. It knows the format, the size, the layout, and it knows what variable it wants to correspond to inside our shader program. Do exactly the same thing for colors. And then we're ready to roll. So what do we do in our rendering function? It's trivial. We clear the screen, so GL clear, and we're telling it what part of the buffer to clear. In this case, we don't care about depth, so we're just clearing the colors. We bind our shader program just to make sure it's the one we think is current, and then we call GL draw arrays. And all that does is that just blitz through the entire array that we've provided and draws everything in it as triangles. In this case, it's just one triangle. If we'd provided VBOs that contained a million triangles, that would draw a million triangles. And because all the data is already on the GPU, it's going to be very, very quick. Any questions so far? Yes? Geometry shader. We'll get to that shortly. Okay. So very simple lighting. We won't go into this in detail because we haven't got much time today. But basically, the Fong lighting model... It's just a way of lighting geometry such that it basically reflects the kind of lighting we use to in real life. We get a contribution from the ambient lighting in the room. So even in the little corners, there's a certain amount of light, even if it's not in direct light. That comes from scattered light all over the place. 
It's just light that's bounced many times. We have diffuse lighting. That's light that's coming straight from a light source, hitting an object, and is scattering equally in all directions. So in that case, the only variable is how much light is actually hitting the surface. And how much light hits the surface depends on how much of a direct line of sight it has. Okay, if we have a piece of paper and the light is shining straight on it, it's going to have a lot of input light. If the light is shining at a very oblique angle, it's not going to have as much. That varies as a cos theta function. So we can use a dot product to model that particular aspect. And then finally, it has a specular component, which is the sharp highlights. That's all based on the reflections. You have to be looking basically at the angle of reflection to see that kind of highlight. That's the shiny bits on the donut up there. So there's just a quick picture of the diffuse lighting setup. We have a light source and a normal vector that points directly away from our surface. And we can use that little expression there to calculate the contribution. Similarly, for the specular component, we have to be have the view vector where our virtual eyeball is aligned with the reflection vector R. Oops, I've gone the wrong way. Sorry. And if that's the case, then we would see a nice specular highlight. If we're a long way from that direction, we wouldn't see the highlight. Just to scare you, that's the equation for it. Don't worry about it too much at all. It's really not that difficult once you break it down, but that's what our shader has to simulate. Let me find the project. Okay, so that's a simple example of fong lighting in action. So it's just a simple donut shape, and you can see the specular highlights on it. You can see the dark areas from the diffuse lighting as the angle of the light just, uh, moves away from the surface normal. So you can get fairly nice lighting just from a very basic model such as fong lighting. Have a quick look at the shaders for that. So our vertex shader is actually pretty simple. I won't bore you to tears with things like eye coordinate systems and stuff like that, but basically the first two lines inside our main function, all they do is they convert from our model coordinates, which is where we decide, yes, our donut is centered at the origin, it's radius one, whatever, and it's positioned at whatever coordinates we care to choose. Here we're just making sure that our normal and our position and our light source coordinates are all in the same coordinate system. So we just multiply by various matrices. And then the one thing that the vertex shader has to do, and if you don't do, you'll be in big trouble, is it has to output this guy here, GL underscore position. It's this guy here that decides how the fixed functionality part of the pipeline actually works. Without that, it doesn't know which parts of your objects are inside the window, which parts are outside, how to interpolate, how to rasterize it. So you have to output to that. And that's in something called um, clip space or projection space. But what we can see is the interface for our shader is actually pretty simple. Up the top, we have two input vertex attributes. We've got vertex position and vertex normal. They correspond exactly to those names that we specified in our OpenGL shader program object, where we told it, yes, we want to turn on this attribute for this particular buffer object. We then have some output variables. And we're outputting position and normal. These are the guys that get fed as output from this. They get interpolated by the fixed functionality part in the rasterizer and they get fed as inputs into the fragment shader. So these will be nicely interpolated for us into the fragment shader. Uniform variables are a way of varying things once per draw call. So the input variables here vary once per vertex. We can have constants, which are always fixed, and uniforms are kind of a happy halfway house in between, where they vary once per draw call. And remember, we can draw a lot of stuff per draw call.
So now to scale you with a fragment shader. So up the top, we see our interface, and we've got ooh, a struct. Yes, you can have structs in GLSL as well, which is the shading language. So we've got a struct called light info. It's got a position and an intensity. And notice we've got handy types like VEC3, VEC4, which allow us to work very nicely with vectors and matrices without having to do all that hard stuff ourselves. So those are uniform variables, so we can modify what our virtual light and our virtual material properties are. We've got input declarations there for our position and normal. They have to match what comes out of the vertex shader. If they don't match, that's when you'll get a linker error when you try to link your shader program. And then down the bottom, we've got a main function. And what we're doing is we're outputting to something called frag color, which I forgot to mention. This is what we declared here. This is our output variable from the fragment shader. This is what the color of the pixel will be on screen. So we just declare that there. Earlier versions of OpenGL predefined that as something called GL underscore frag color. In modern OpenGL, you can call it whatever you like. So in here, we're calling a handy little function that's fairly standard, ADS model, ambient diffuse specular, and we're passing in our position and our normal, and we're doing some simple vector maths up here to calculate those vectors that are in those two diagrams to decide what the color of that particular pixel should be. Don't worry too much about the mass in there. It's just implementing what was in those other slides. But some nice things to note is we can do things such as vector arithmetic just by using these VEC3s. So they act just like the C++ overloaded operators. We've got some handy functions like normalize, which will normalize your vector. We've got a very handy function called reflect. Now what this does is we've got our surface normal. So we've got our surface, we've got the normal. I need, need another pair of hands. We've got our light ray coming in to our normal. That function will very kindly calculate us the vector reflected about that normal for us. Okay, to do that by hand is a bit of a pain. GLSL has got those sorts of functions built into it. There's other ones for refraction and all sorts of things. So once we've done that, it outputs our frag color. Job done. That pixel gets to the screen. Right. Put my dibber. So that's basic fong lighting. Now we can start to go to town with some of these things. We can modify what we're doing. So we can have some cartoon shading. This is actually very, very simple to do. We just use the normal fung lighting model. We throw away the specular highlights. And instead of having smooth transitions from one color to another, we just use a step function, basically. So I got that open. Nope. Uh, where are you gone? Bear with me one second. There we go. So we've got a I for one welcome our giant insect overlords. Right, so we've got a nice ladybird model, I think it's supposed to be, but without any textures, it looks nothing like a ladybird. But you can see there, we've got nice solid blocks of colour, and they vary sharply from one block to another. And there's only, I think, four colours in that particular image there. But it simulates quite nicely cartoon rendering. And we could change the colour of it by changing our material properties or our virtual light properties. We can modify the number of steps of shades that we want very, very simply. So just to show you the shaders, how they differ from the normal fung lighting model, it's really trivial. So once you've got your basic lighting up and working, then our tune shade 
model inside of our shaders, inside our fragment shader this is, is very simple. Our diffuse lighting factor is our cosine, the difference between the light source position and the normal. And all we do is we use that and we take the floor, you take the integer part of that value. So that just gives us discrete levels between 0 and 1. Okay. We've got a constant there for the number of different colors we want to use in that example. We can easily change that to make numbers of different shades. If we were to slowly increase that number from 4 up to infinity, this would just reduce back down to the normal ambient and diffuse lighting model. Okay. To make that more interesting, rather than being a constant, we could of course make that a uniform. And uniforms we can set from our application to vary things on the fly. Right, the guy at the back asked about geometry shaders. Geometry shaders are an additional programmable stage in our pipeline. They sit in between the vertex shader and the fragment shader. So typically, the vertex shader is responsible for transforming vertices from one coordinate system to another. The fragment shader we've seen is responsible for taking our various vertex attributes and calculating a pixel color. That's all well and good. The geometry shader is a bit of a wild card. You can use it for all sorts of different things. This particular example will show is how to do a wireframe overlay on top of your um, 3D rendering in one pass. There's been lots of techniques over the years for doing wireframes in multiple passes, but they all suffer from various things like Z fighting and um, offsets you have to apply to get them to work nicely. So let's have a quick look at that running. Oh, again, not open. Is that in here? Wireframe, no. Open gel. Rendering. Which one are you? So there we are. We've got an aeroplane, little toy aeroplane model, and you can see all the triangles that make up that mesh. Okay, this one's not particularly complex, but often if you're trying to debug your three-dimensional scenes, it's very handy to be able to see the triangles that actually make it up. And overlaying a wireframe like this is a very handy thing to be able to do at the debug stage. Oops, I'm a bit close. So how do we do that? Turns out the key is in the geometry shader, otherwise I wouldn't be mentioning it. Triangles. Everybody loves triangles, especially that Pythagoras dude. What can we do with triangles? Well, what can't we do with triangles? Right. Triangle, as you know, has three vertices. Those dotted lines going across represent the height of the vertex away from the opposite edge of the triangle. And using a little mathematical trick called the cosine rule, given the three vertices of the triangles, we can quite easily calculate those three heights. Great, what does that buy us? Well, what we do is in our geometry shader, we have our vertex positions and the normals and the colors and whatever else we're passing in. What we can do in the geometry shader is we can augment that information. And we augment it by providing these three vertex heights. Okay, that's all well and good. The geometry shader does nothing else. It calculates those heights and passes them on. So in the fragment shader, remember in the fragment shader, all of our vertex properties have been nicely interpolated. So every pixel in our triangle will have the HA, HB, and HC heights interpolated to its pixel position. One second. Does something wrong with the picture? Quite probably. Huh? Quite probably. The heights should intersect in one point. Yeah, this is just my crummy drawing. <laughs> I had two sick kids last week. I drew this about three o'clock in the morning. 
So we've got HA, HB, and HC vertex attributes going across into our pixel shader, our fragment shader. In our fragment shader, they're nicely interpolated. So every pixel will have an HA, HB, and HC value interpolated to its position. From those, if we take the minimum of HA, HB, and HC, we can find out which corner or which edge, sorry, we are closest to. Yeah? Once we know which edge we are closest to, we can say, are we within, say, two pixels of that? And if we are, we color that fragment a different color. The line color, perhaps. So, very quick look at the implementation of that. Oop, wrong file. That's our vertex shader, there's nothing interesting there. That's our geometry shader. So what are we doing? We are using our cosine rule. So we're calculating the edges or the vectors between the vertices. We use the cosine rule to calculate the internal angles. We're using simple trigonometry to calculate those HA, HB and HC heights. And then we do some stuff that's unique to the geometry shader. we have a variable called g underscore edge distance. This is something we have made up. Up the very top, we've got an output variable we've called g underscore edge distance. The g stands for geometry. So what we're doing is we're calculating our edge distance for our first vertex, and we use HA for the first one, HB for the second one, HC for the third one. And for each of our vertices, we do the similar thing with the normals and the positions, except in this case, we're just passing them through straight from the vertex shader. We don't do anything with them. And then we do something called emit vertex. We have to do this because the geometry shader also can act like a filter. It can throw stuff away if it wants. In this case, we don't want to throw anything away. So for every vertex we get in, we emit another vertex as well. That means you can do nice things like geometry culling with your, ver your geometry shader as well. We do the same thing for the other vertices, and at the end we call end primitive. So the geometry shader actually has access to all of the points in your particular shape, so in your triangle. That's all relatively straightforward. In the fragment shader, we have an input variable corresponding to our G edge distance. And notice we've got this hint at the start of that called no perspective. That tells it not to do perspective correct interpolation. The details of that don't worry too much about. It's just a little knob we can tweak to make things look a bit nicer. And then down the bottom, we basically calculate our normal color using our Fong lighting model function. And then we find the point or the edge that's closest to our particular pixel. And then we're basically just determining if it's within some size of it or not. If it's within the distance of a line, we color it as a line. If it's outside, we color it as a normal pixel. So we've got a nice wireframe overlay without doing too much work. Nice thing about this is if you've got modern OpenGL, you can easily retrofit this into any existing application. You can see all the wireframes in your models. And you can easily turn it on and off. You just don't compile in the geometry shader. Right, instance rendering. We'll finish off with this. Instance rendering, it's insane. What do we do? We have a base mesh, so we define one object, or a few objects. And we then define another vertex buffer object, which contains all of our so-called per instance data. In this particular case, our per instance data will consist of x, y, z points. Just three dimensional points. And then what we do is we say to the GPU, I've got this mesh here. I want you to render a copy of this mesh for every data point in this other vertex buffer object. And GPUs love doing this stuff. They love it. All right. They're really, really happy with all this data to work with. They don't have to wait around for your slow as snail CPU to do anything. 
so they can just get on with it and blast vertexes and pixels at the screen. All right. So and the really nice thing is we do this in one function call in OpenGL. So let's have a quick look at this. Uh, bear with me one second, let me find the example. Uh, set that as the active one. And run it. So there we go. So what we're doing in this application is we've got two base meshes. We've got a cube and we've got our donut. Incidentally, each of those donuts contains about 5,000 points. Okay, that's nothing particularly heavy nowadays, but we're rendering lots of them. And then we've got two additional vertex buffer objects that contain those sine wave functions that we're updating inside our update function at 60 frames a second. And then on each frame, we are just doing two OpenGL function calls. We're saying draw the red donuts with this set of data points and draw the green boxes with this set of data points. And at that point, the, G the CPU is free to go off and do whatever it cares to do. So in this case, if I zoom out a bit, yeah, we can see we're using quite a few points here. Okay. On modern GPUs, you can quite happily throw 50,000 instances at them without batting an eyelid for multiple different instance types. Okay. On uh, a typical application now, you could probably get around about 300 or so instance drawing calls into every frame before you start running out of steam. Um, this allows us to render insane amounts of data. So how do we do that? Yep, you're not limited to only passing in the positions. You could pass in rotations, so that could take the form of complete matrices. You can pass in entire sets of matrices, if you like, if you're doing um, skinned meshes, so you your bone animation. Uh, you can pass in quaternions, whatever you like. Your vertex buffer object is entirely up to you what data is in there, and it's entirely up to you in your shaders how you interpret that data. Okay, this is the very simple case where we're just passing in positions. So this would be often be used for rendering huge amounts of trees in a flight simulator, for example, or huge numbers of blades of grass in a first person shooter. So we do this. As our initialized function. So we've got a simple class that creates a torus and a simple class that creates a cube. They just create our vertex buffer objects with positions and normals for that base mesh. Nothing exciting in there. We then create some vertex buffer objects that hold our data. So we do this in exactly the same way as we did for normal mesh data. We create them, set the usage pattern, bind them, allocate some data. Our data itself comes from an update function which is called in response to our timer. And all we do in here is we're calculating our sine and cos functions for our data points. Easy peasy. Inside our render function, we clear the screen. We bind, oops, sorry. We bind our data vertex buffer object. And then we just call the allocate function again. And we pass in a pointer to our new set of data for that frame. So that copies from CPU memory to our GPU memory, our data points. We then carry on. We set some uniform variables up for this particular rendering pass. And there's one other key factor, which is, where have you gone? Do, 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 do. Bear with me one second. Yeah, sorry. There we go. To tell it how that instance data should vary, we have to call one extra function. We call GL vertex attrib divisor. We pass in something called a location, which is just like the name of our variable inside our vertex array, inside our vertex shader, and we tell it one. That one means 
we want to draw one copy of our instance for every point inside our instance data vertex buffer object. Okay, it's essentially doing a for loop on the GPU and it's pulling out a new instance data every time around that loop. Then inside our drawing function, instead of calling GL draw elements or GL draw arrays, we just call GL draw elements instanced. And we pass into that information about the number of indices per our base mesh and the number of points in our data vertex buffer object. With that, it's got enough information to go away and do all that clever stuff. Okay, and just to show you one final example of that, we can do that on a grander scale. There we go. So what do we have there? We have, in that case, we're doing exactly the same kind of setup. In this case, we've only got one data set, but this time, instead of just creating a simple sine cos wave in one direction, we are creating a uh, two-dimensional function. So we've got X and Y, and we're calculating a Z value. In actual fact, that's plotting the Bessel function, which turns out to be the solution for when you hit the skin of a drum, how the skin of the drum vibrates. So it's doing that. So our update function is iterating over 10,000 points. It's calculating our function value. We copy that into our vertex buffer object. And in our shaders, what we're doing is we're taking the position of the cube. We're using our instance data to decide where that cube should be placed. We are then deciding how tall should that cube be. So we use our Z value of our function to stretch and scale our cube in the Y direction. So that gives us our height. And then also we decide what color that cube should be based on its uh, function value. So you can do a lot more than just offsetting stuff with your um, instanced array data. So with this, it's really quite nice. You can sort of come in quite close and you'll see when it pings up, we're getting a nice highlight on the cubes in front of us. We've still got per pixel lighting going on here. So our fragment shade is still doing all that nice Fong lighting calculation stuff. It's doing it on lots and lots of pieces of data. We're getting decent performance on a six-year-old laptop with a pretty crappy GPU by today's standards. And we're doing that for 10,000 points, and we're doing it in one function call. All right? One function call. That means your CPU is sitting there twiddling its thumbs, doing diddly squat most of the time. All right? Okay, in this particular case, we're calculating 10,000 data point values, but we could easily offload that into another thread. It's not doing anything OpenGL specific. OK, so this is yeah, pretty naff old laptop. We can do all this sort of funky stuff. The background, incidentally, is just a simple noise function, which is, again, calculated on the fly in the fragment shader. And we'll hopefully have a look at that a little bit this afternoon. How are we doing for time? Five minutes. Right. So let's have a quick look at how we would do that in the shaders. So we've seen the application side of it. We've got our base mesh. We've got our vertex buffer object with our data. We call the attribute divisor function to tell it how to iterate over our instance data. And we issue the one drawing call. Job done. Oh, wrong file. Bear me one second. There we go. OK, so what have we got? Up the top, we define our vertex shader interface as usual. We've got our normal vertex attributes. We've got position, normal, texture coordinates we're not using in this case. They're just something I forgot to delete. And finally, we have um, our vertex attribute called point. This is actually our instance data. This is the one where we're telling it to vary once per copy of our mesh. So I've just added a comment there to say that varies once per instance. 
just so I don't forget what it is. We've got some uniform variables there we can set to tweak things. This HSV to RGB function is just something I found on the web, copy and pasted. And then inside our main function is where we do our interesting stuff. So what do we do? We move the cuboid according to the X and Z values. So we're using the swizzle operators, X and Z. We can access individual elements of our vectors. And we're taking our vertex position, which comes from our base mesh. And we're adding to that point dot XZ. So we're just taking our cube, picking it up, moving it over here, dropping it down again. That's all we're doing in that line. The cube scale is just to shrink it down so we can get enough points on the screen. We then move the vertex up by 0.5 in the y direction. This is so that the bottom of the cube lies on the uh, y equals zero plane. Okay, Our cube by default is centered on the origin, so I'm just shifting it up a little bit. The next step is we multiply our y position of the vertex by the y value of our data function. That has the effect of keeping the bottom of the cube on the plane and it scales the top or the bottom by whatever our data point is. So it elongates our cube according to that data. Dead easy. We then do some coordinate system transformations. That's nothing of any particular interest or nothing new. And then down the bottom here, we pick a color. So we're just mixing a hue from 0.5 to 0 0.05 and we're blending it based on something according to our data value. So that's just changing the color based on that. Convert it to RGB. And then finally, we output the GL position coordinate so the fixed functionality part of the pipeline works as usual. That's it, job done. Okay, so in that case, the vertex shade is doing most of the hard work. The fragment shader is exactly the same as the Fong lighting model we saw earlier. It doesn't do anything different. As far as the fragment shader is concerned, nothing unusual is going on. Right. Have we don't have time. Okay, right. Let's a couple more slides, and then we'll stop. Post-processing. This opens up a whole range of fun and games you can have with OpenGL. What we have on the left here is the first pass of our rendering. So this is what we've just been seeing. We render some objects to the screen. Well, in this case, we don't render them to the screen. We render them to something called a frame buffer object. This is just an off-screen buffer. Okay, nothing particularly complex about it. It's got a texture attached to it. So we create a texture object, we attach it to our frame buffer object, and we render. That gets our image, which would normally appear on the screen, into our texture. And then in the second pass, all we do is we render a simple rectangle made up of two triangles that covers the entire screen. And we render it using our texture. That means inside the fragment shader of our second pass, we can really go to town on it. All right, we can do some interesting stuff. So there you see a simple example of an edge detection filter. That's pretty boring, but just shows the basic principle. So that's actually rendering our toy plane image that we saw in the geometry shader example, and just running a very simple filter that picks out the edges. We can do the same thing with blurs. And in actual fact, I think both of these you can get straight from the cute graphical effects module. Someone has taken away this idea and implemented this inside QML for you. So you can just pick up the appropriate effect from the cute graphical effects module. That takes care of all the hard work of rendering your QML items into a frame buffer object, running a second pass over it to do all these fancy filtering techniques. We can iterate that multiple times. So here we can see an example of where we do something retro. Let's have a look. Okay, so here's our insect overlord again. That's how it looks normally. And then we've got a horrible 
retro 1980s really craptastic TV effect. Okay, so what have we got going on here? We've got vignetting around the outside. It gets darker towards the edges. We've got flickering. We've got color separation. We've got poor zoom control. So it actually zooms in and out a bit as it goes in the TV effect. And we've got the horrible TV lines that you get. Okay, all of that is done in the fragment shader very easily. Quick two minute glance at that and then we'll stop for questions. So our vertex shader is exactly the same as we've had before. It just passes the vertices through after transforming them. And then inside our fragment shader is where the fun happens. So we can do lots of things procedurally in here. So here we're varying the scale of our texture coordinates a little, just a little bit. That makes it look like the TV has got very poor zoom control. Okay, your electron guns are not very well behaving. This is just looking up the original texture coordinates. Um, sorry, but from a slightly different location for the red, green and blue components. So that means it's kind of splitting the three color components from left to right a little bit. So that's like your three electron guns in your TV are not properly aligned. We can reduce the contrast by using a simple mathematical function that makes it look like a yeah, really poor, cheap TV. The vignetting we can add in by simply darkening the corners of the screen based on the texture coordinates. We can tint it green. So we could make this a uniform and tint it whatever color we like. If you've got a penchant for the amber phosphor screens rather than the green phosphor ones. TV lines come from a simple sign function. Time is passed in as a uniform variable from the application. We simply have a rapidly varying sine wave that just makes the color slightly darker or lighter. And for the flicker, exactly the same idea again. We have a sine function that just modulates the brightness a little bit at 50 hertz or whatever. Okay. And then down the bottom, this last bit just combines the original image with the previous one and sweeps it in and out. So you can really go to town quite easily in a handful of lines of code and get some really bizarre effects. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, how do you access the uniform um, variables from, from the main code? Sorry, yes, I realized halfway through I forgot to show that. Right, how do we access uniform variables from the application side? Good news is it's trivial. So let me find a source file. Here we go. So what we have is the shader variable is our QOpenGL shader program instance, or pointer to, I should say. And then it's got a very handy function called set uniform value. It takes in two things. The first one is the name of our uniform variable in our vertex or fragment shader. And the second argument is the data we want to assign to it. Okay, and it's got about a gazillion overloads for all the usual cute types that we have available. So it's got overloads for things like QVector 3D, QVector 4D, QMatrix 4x4, all those good things that come in useful. Okay. Is there a new uh, way to deal with extensions in, in Qt 5? In because I saw this uh, this class uh, OpenGL version functions or something. Mm -hmm. Does this all do the extension loading for you? Unfortunately, okay, the question was, is there a way to deal with extensions in OpenGL? Extensions are parts that are not part of the core um, layer of OpenGL. We have to re resolve them dynamically at runtime. So unfortunately, I missed the merge window for Qt 5.0 but I've got a whole bunch of patches pending for 5.1. And in 5.1, then hopefully we will be able to expose any extension you care to name and also any particular set of functions for a given version of OpenGL. So this object is not already in... It's OpenGL. not in 5.0. It will hopefully be in mm -hmm. 5.1. Okay. Um, did you come to the training the other day? Uh, no. No. Okay. Well, you can just go on Garrett and get it anyway. If you go on to Garrett, um, I'll, if you come talk to me afterwards, I'll give you the link to where the patch is. 
you can just apply it on top of Qt5 today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what you get is essentially an another function on QOpenGL context. And you say, give me this extension or give me this set of functions for this particular version. Okay. Okay. The good thing about that is you then get compile time errors if you were trying to use a function that isn't in that version. Uh, how well is this supported on every platform? When you say this. Well, um, I don't know. Um, okay. The version of the, of the OpenGL, and, and can I run this on Windows and Linux on any hardware, basically, without any modifications? Okay. So support is a can of worms. All right. You're dealing with many, many different types of hardware. OpenGL ES2 is the baseline for Qt5. That supports vertex shaders and fragment shaders. Okay. It doesn't support instance rendering. OpenGL ES3 does, which has been ratified a couple of months ago, so hardware should start to appear that supports it soon. On the desktop, yes, you can use instance rendering on any modern OpenGL card. And geometry shaders as well? Geometry shaders came in in OpenGL 3.2, I think. So as long as your graphics card driver supports that or newer, you'll be good. So how does this work on Windows with Angle? With Angle, it doesn't. It doesn't. No. Angle supports OpenGL 2. Okay. If you want to use geometry shaders and things like this on Windows with OpenGL, compile it with the um, desktop OpenGL option rather than the Angle one. Okay. The good news is we could potentially make use of this stuff inside Qt Quick 2 to increase the rendering performance in there. If you've got many items all the same that vary in something that could be abstracted away as instance data, then you could really do a lot of performance improvements there. Okay, one more. Okay. Um, would a custom fragment shader be the right way to do hole punching for an underlay uh, running video on hardware? Yes. Okay, that would be the quickest way to do it. Yes, there's a very, very simple way to do that. Um, well, there's several ways to do it, but if you're doing it with a fragment shader, what you do is you say, if my condition is true, discard okay if you just call the discard um, keyword that acts as an early return from the fragment shader and it just bins that pixel there and then doesn't execute any further so that's one way of doing it. other ways you can do it is with alpha maps in textures and things like that so depending on what you've got available benchmark it on your systems see what works out the best okay thanks Go on then, squeeze another one in. <laughs> I don't want to keep you from your lunch or anything. Uh, do you plan to add the support for compute shaders? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. OpenGL 3, which we've seen today, is what supports geometry shaders in addition to vertex and fragment shaders. OpenGL 4 takes this even further. It introduces things called tessellation control shaders, tessellation evaluation shaders, and in OpenGL 4.3, something new called compute shaders. Compute shaders are like a mini version of OpenCL. Okay, they allow you to do generic computations on the GPU. And then you can visualize those results directly in another rendering pass using normal shaders. Yes, my aim is to add those into Qt 5.1. Okay. I just need to find a decent set of drivers for my card at home. But I've already got a patch for geometry shaders to go into Qt 5.1. Uh, what I've been using here is a little bit of a hack to show how to work those around at the moment. Um, they work with QGL shader program, but not Qt OpenGL shader program at the moment. Yeah, there's a bit of an API confusion. Um, but yes, hopefully tessellation shaders and compute shaders will make it into 5.1. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.